welcome to this first Training Tidbits podcast. This series is going to be a joint venture between me, Ryan Cartledge from Animal Training Academy and Dr. Kat Gregory from Creative Animal Solutions. Hello, good morning, Dr. Kat. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm good. How's it in Melbourne today? Um, I just went for a swim with Rumi, my dog, and it was like a washing machine in Port Phillip Bay. So no visibility, couldn't see anything, and um, it actually bothers me when I can't see anything. I worry about things that might be seeing me as opposed to me being able to see them and getting out of their way. But anyway, and, and it's there's a good all these listeners in America get going, oh, my God, she's in Australia and she's swimming in the ocean. What's wrong with her? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, white sharks. What else have we got? Crocodiles, not down here. Um, jellyfish, everything that can bite, eat and sting you, we've got. But um, the ocean here is beautiful and um, warm and it is summertime, so it's absolutely worth getting out there. And I just love swimming in the bay. And Rumi, my dog, comes along with me and he's a local personality more so than I am, I think. Um, we're going to be mainly picking your brain today, Dr. Kat, and, and discussing this important idea that everyone should know about animal behaviour. But before we do, though, just, just some brief introductions for all of you out there. My name is Ryan Cartledge. I'm the founder of Animal Training Academy here in New Zealand. And my goal is really to empower animals and human animals alike and, and give people the tools they need to succeed with animal training. So... After nearly a decade in the zoo industry, I've started this venture to, to start help provide those tools. And my current project, I'm currently in the process of setting up a completely free online course on animal behaviour and, and consequently I'm very busy on my new website. So head over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and check out what's going on over there. Uh, like I said, there's a three, free animal training tidbits course. Uh, which is podcast compliments. And this is really the first, there's going to be a huge series of podcasts we have planned. Um, I'm also hard at work on the Animal Training 202 coursework. So Animal Training 101 has been a huge success and I'm very excited about this advanced course that I'm developing. I've learned so much in the last year with Animal Training Academy about really about what you, our audience, want to learn about and the challenges you're facing. So this course is really going to be something special and keep your ears out for that one. I'm really interested in what you guys want to learn about. I'm making this course for you and about you. So once again, head over to animaltrainingacademy.com. Send me a message on there on the contact form. I'd love to hear from any one of you and I really want to know uh, how we can help you. So, yeah, don't be shy about sending, sending me or Dr. Cat a message. Now, Dr. Kat, you're doing some amazing things over the ditch there in Melbourne, and me and you are constantly talking all sorts of animal training related topics. I believe yeah, and I, you. Sorry, no, you're gone. I was just going to say that probably our connection has 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 evolved over the last few months, or yeah, a few months, because we're both passionate about education of the wider audience, and I think that networking between different organisations and individuals is only going to advance the um, overall welfare of animals and care of humans across the world. And I think this is a fabulous step forward. Yeah, great. And thank, uh, thank you, Ryan. No, you're welcome. Thank you. And I know that me and you were discussing earlier about, you know, in Australasia, we're always getting people in from other countries to come over here and teach us, which we love, and, and we're very grateful for that. But at the same time, we've got so much expertise and knowledge down here, down in this part of the world. So we're trying to create these avenues, I guess, and we've been talking about this for for our people to tap into to you and to tap into to me and to tap into other people so that's what i guess we're going to be focusing a lot of these podcasts and we're going to be trying to get some of these uh local locals amazing people when we try to dump their brains onto you guys so there's some cool stuff coming up and i believe Kat, that you're literally a day or two away from commencing a new animal show you and the team at moonlight sanctuary over there in melbourne maybe tell us a little bit about that and a little bit about yourself as well Sure. Um, I, it's a funny journey, I suppose. I was initially trained as a veterinary surgeon. I, I grew up as a child surrounded by animals and all sort, of all sorts. And my love of animals evolved into becoming a vet. And then uh, I trained post-grad. I trained in anesthesia and critical care. And part of that was an interest in animal behavior. And then I also have Again, postgrad um, qualifications in animal behaviour. So I'm actually a qualified veterinary behaviourist in Australia and work as an animal behaviour consultant in the domestic 
industry here, but also I've got a passion for wild captive animals and their welfare. So I've done quite a, a volume of work within the zoo industry and aquarium industry here in Australia and overseas. Part of that initially was to teach the trainers in facilities and the veterinary teams to work best together so that we can train animals up for a variety of veterinary and husbandry procedures so that we don't have to use anesthesia as often. And I know intuitively and through evidence over the years that the welfare improvements in animals care is exponential when things um, – when good training is instituted within within the industry. Um, I'm, I'm quite creative, I suppose, as well, and I think some of my passion has now evolved into trying to educate the wider public about the conservation status of animals and so that using shows, education-based shows, as a conduit for that. So I've set up show a show recently in Africa this year at a conservation facility for cheetahs and now I'm just about to open – a show which is multi-species um, and mammals and birds, fly free flight birds at a little facility called Moonlit Sanctuary just locally to me in Pearsdale. So we're all um, a little bit nervous right now, but i um, dying to show the public what we've been working towards over the last eight months. So it's, um, it's quite exciting times really, and we're all going to have heaps of fun showing what we know. And so are the animals. That's that's the other aspect. I want the animals to absolutely want to be out there to show everything they have and to absolutely enjoy every moment on stage. And so that's what we're working hard towards and to maintain. Fantastic. And what a unique experience base. Yeah, it's interesting, that's for sure. I have a hard time explaining it to people, but I just get out there and keep doing it. And I guess over the last several years, I've done a fair bit of public speaking at different venues, including Tactic last year, which you can probably explain, but it's the Zoo Industries Annual um, Animal Training um, Conference, and that, oh, at that I was one of the keynote speakers. And I guess what I wanted to do was to say to people that there is – why I wanted people who were in the audience who are very good trainers to have a real, really good think about why it is they do what they do, not just what they do, but why they do it. And um, underlying everything that I am about is to create a relationship that's based on trust and create a level of resilience in the relationship between humans and animals. And so hopefully advance welfare, animal welfare that way. Um, and to to keep on progressing and learning, and I, I'm I'm a humble um, learner as well, and ongoing. So so that's why um, people like you, Ryan, come in as well. So I'm, I'm I can learn from lots of different people, and I'm certainly open to it. Yeah. So I'm gonna, hopefully going to learn from the audience as well. Yeah, well, that's our hope, and and, and for you, those of you out there that are interested in le- further learning opportunities, me and Kat are, are just. In the early stages of discussing future webinars and, and opportunities where we can interact uh, directly more so than, than just through these podcasts and, and through videos and through written mediums. So keep your ears out for those things. Now, uh, Kat, a while ago you and me were having a pretty cool conversation about some of the first <laughs> animals that we ever trained and you told me a story about a macaw that you were working with. And I, yeah, I really well- Yep, go, go ahead. Sorry, Ryan, oh, to interrupt. No, wor- no worries at all. I was just going to say I really like these stories. I love to know, you know, where people came from, where people started, you know, especially I think a lot of people when they hear stories like yours and, and uh, you know, I've, I've shared mine with you as well, people can relate to certain aspects of that and, and they find community in that. Um, and, I, and I think I kind of wanted you to repeat that story today because I, I quite liked it and I think it leads quite nicely into our main topic today, which is, you know, this important idea that we want to share that everyone should know about animal behaviour. So, yeah, maybe, Kev, you can share that story with our listeners and um, then we'll, sure. we'll get moving on to, to what we're going to talk about today. Okay. I just arrived, I had just arrived at a facility where we had a really lovely bird show and um, – one of the very first things I was involved with was um, one of the animals who was um, in that show, uh, Greenwing Macaw, had um, the day before had fallen out of the sky um, experiencing a seizure. Um, thankfully, the bird survived the fall um, and then he was presented to the veterinary department for us to try and work out what his problem 
was and um, the, the absolute reason for his uh, seizure was that his calcium levels were extremely low in his blood sprit, or bloodstream, which um, had resulted in the seizure activity. And the calcium levels were really low because he was profoundly emaciated. He was severely underweight and no one had actually realised what was going on with this bird until it was almost too late. And I went to the training department to try and work out what had been going wrong. And they, over time, um, had gradually managed, in inverted commas, managed this animal's weight down to improve his level of motivation in training. And I, we had a meeting with um, between the veterinary department and the training department and I stood up in the meeting as a real, real novice and I just said in the group that I thought that we, there must be a better way to train birds rather than to simply starve them. And everybody turned to me and said, well, maybe you can show us. <laughs> and I stood there and I thought, okay, now's my opportunity to learn. So I went out and um, networked with people that I know um, very well here in Australia. I, I, I really do believe that, that, that animals of any ilk don't need to be in such, um, so, in such a distressing situation that they're actually starving to um, force them to work. There is no need for that, certainly with a social species like a parrot. And I think it holds true across the board for any animal. Um, underlying um, all good training is um, trust, I think. I think over to you, Ryan. Have you got any comments on that little story? Oh, I just remember you know, being in a, a situation that shares some similarities. I just remember you know, having a bird that had some pretty strong, undesirable behaviours, uh, I'd label them as, as quite aggressive, and you know, no one really providing me with any tools as to how to, to deal with the situation. And I, I guess I... She had similar thoughts to you. Maybe I knew that there was a better way, and I knew someone somewhere in the world could train this bird in, in a positive and unintrusive manner. I didn't know what it was. I didn't even know what that meant at the time, um, but yeah. I, I just knew that it was. And I, I just, I did the same thing as you. I went out and I, I sought answers, and I found them. Um, and and I went back and I applied, and I, I thought, yeah, here's my opportunity, and and I did it, and I. You know, and I remember, you know, the surprise on some people's faces when uh, I, I did some things with a particular animal that they, you know, probably might not have been in their possible mind frame as to something that that animal would do, and, you know, and yep. I use positive reinforcement to achieve that. And I, I love that because... I do you know that. why? Do you know why you prefer positive reinforcement over any other style? Well, using that as your bias in your training? Uh, well, I guess it's, you know, you say trust and, and for me, I'm all about empowerment and the trust, I guess, comes from that that opportunity for your animal to, to decide, to make those decisions and, and for you to to provide something the animal wants, whether it's food, whether it's, you know, companionship in, in a parrot or a toy or access to a different space or whatever that is, you positively reinforce the correct decisions, the ones that you decide are correct, and then it's the long-term effects, and maybe that's something that takes a while to see, but when you see an empowered animal and how that empowered animal interacts with within its own environment and the decisions it makes, the decision it makes when it might be put into a challenging situation, novel stimuli around, uh, and it, you know it makes a decision to, like you say, trust you, come towards you. That's... How I internally uh, view welfare. Yep. Right. I think underlying all welfare is the um, the underlying point of it all is to give an animal a choice. The animal has a choice to partake in an activity or not. Having a level of autonomy and self determination, I think, is inherent to welfare. I think that um, it's across the board whether you're talking about humans, great apes, or whether you're talking about fish. I think giving an animal a choice will make it feel more comfortable in its environment. And I guess um, there's a quote from someone called, what is his name? Ray Moody. And I always have a in my back of my mind, and it says that greatest motivational act you can do for another is to listen. So it's about um, listening to what the animal has to say 
and taking note of it. And, and the animal is part of the conversation in training as much as you, the trainer, are. But um, you, the trainer, have the power to allow that animal to be in a better space psychologically or not. And I think hopefully most people who will be listening to these sorts of podcasts will be people that will think that how an animal feels is important and I want an animal to feel comfortable with the people that care for it, underlying it all. So that's what my underlying raison d'etre is when working with creatures other than humans. And I guess, um, however, by default, I've learned that if I can get enough people thinking along those lines, then overall welfare improves across the board. I cannot do this alone, and that's part of why um, education for many people in this area is important. Um, One person or two people cannot do this change alone, and I think it's important that we stand up as examples of what's possible. Don't and, spend any time criticising others, but stand up to show people what's possible with with a bias on positive reinforcement in what we do with our interactions with animals and people. And, and the thoughts and feelings side of things, I mean, you just kind of got to follow the science that's coming out now. Yep. And, and you, you're gonna, you can't really argue with with that. And um, just just because we're gonna move on just a little bit, but I just want to <coughs> read because we're this is on topic straight from your website, Cat. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a nice nice quote you have from Viktor Frankl that says between stimulus and response there is a space in that space lies our freedom and power to choose our response in our response lies our growth and freedom and I think freedom is a nice word there yeah. and, that, and that, that symbolizes empowerment and that symbolizes tr- tr- our trust well that's going to lead on to trust and yeah I quite like that, that quote I think that's I'm glad you up. do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think I, 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 there are greater minds than mine, and if I can find something that crystallizes the way I think, as an example, it's a, it's what I tend to grab on to use. I guess you'll find a lot of those sort of things scattered, scattered throughout my little website. But I absolutely believe in those things. The other thing that's important is that sort of that quote mentions also. It actually refers quite well to the training transaction where yeah. you request. Um, something from an animal and you should always give it a little space, a little moment in time where the animal has that moment to choose how to Mm -hmm. respond to your cue. Um, Then you find out whether you've taught the animal well and it understands what you want or whether something else is more reinforcing the environment or the animal really doesn't know what it is that you've intended for it to learn. Um, but to give that animal a moment to respond is really important, not to, to not to get frustrated, but to give just a few moments of time for that animal to choose how it's going to respond. Um, and that will make your training, it's part of timing and training. It's um, something that everyone learns over time. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> it's an alliteration. And, 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 and when you... You see an animal deciding, you know, deciding if it's going to do what you've been reinforcing it to do or it's going to do what it's possibly had a long history of reinforcement, which is different than what you've been asking. And I like those moments where you see the head go one way, go the other way, go one way, and then they make the decision to do what you want because you've got the positive, you've got the reinforcements right, you've paired them with the correct behaviour. And those beautiful little moments where you can see that animal you can see the clogs going in his head. And yep, then- and you're in the zone. Basically, athletes call it in the zone, and I think it's when you're in the zone. It's about a sharing of minds, and it's a- an absolute thrill, especially when, like, for instance, when I've been flying, for instance, a peregrine that I had a passion for, and he used to fly over the top of me after I'd let him play in the air for a little while, and he'd actually deliberately fly over the top of me to see what game we were going to play in training on that day and then fly quickly back to his tree where he always sat before I signaled him to come in to do what we were going to do in our game. It was like the thrill of that animal who can fly at 150 k's an hour on a flat who then chooses to work with you because that relationship that you have with that animal is absolutely the way it should be. Um, that That is magic and what a thrill that can be. So, I'm sure a lot of our listeners out there are you know, thinking about similar stories they have yeah, uh, and, and and I know that a lot of people contact me and ask me, you know, I'm at X Y institution and people are doing this. I don't think it's right. Just you can share and maybe some of the stories me and Kat have just shared, and hopefully you'll you'll find the similar experiences are not too far in your futures. Uh, and rather so, than rather than, sorry, go ahead, Ryan. You have to keep me on track. <laughs> <laughs> I was just yeah, we're going to talk about this, this uh, topic today, which is you know an important 
element of, of training of, of behavior that, that everyone should know about. Um, so just going to start off with a question for you, you know, in terms of feeling, uh, especially with your consultancy work with pets and pet owners, you know, what, what do you think would be the most frequent question, you know, people are asking you about behavior when you go in to maybe see a dog that's doing something yep. desirable? Yeah. Whenever I get a request, it's, um, and it's almost 99% of the time, the owner uh, of the animal will ask me to, and they say, how do I stop my dog from jumping? How do I stop my dog from nipping the children? How do I stop my, how can I make it stop barking all day when I'm not home? And it's like, well, um, the, the response to that is how do you, um, stop? How do you train an animal to not do something? How, how do you do that? It's actually impossible. What do you – so what I ask the client then to think about is what it, What I, I turn it around and I say, what would you prefer? What is it that you would prefer your animal to do? And then we spend a lot of time heavily reinforcing alternate behaviours and what often happens is that the problematic behaviour – simply melts away because it's no longer reinforcing for the animal, the dog, the cat, the bird, whatever it might be. Um, so I kind of um, have to convince the owner that we might not be approaching the problem in uh, directly by uh, often I think people are looking for ways to punish behaviours to stop them. And I want the animal and the owner to stay together and part of the staying together is that I want to maintain and enhance the relationship they have and by introducing punishment into that relationship I'm going to poison it so I, I absolutely don't concentrate going down that path I always try and work out what it is the owner would prefer the animal does and I can give them some guidance about how to create that and um we get far better outcomes long term and I get a far better relationship that is a consequence. Even if sometimes the problematic behaviours sometimes continue beyond the consultation period, if the owners better understand how to manage things better, um, their relationship's maintained and that above all is important. Most of the animals, all the animals I see are members of the family. You don't just throw your members of the family away because they're frustrating you. Um, people are willing to try, I think. And I, if I treat humans correctly they and, and support them through the process, they, um, they can, and it's not that hard necessarily, but the support that you provide is important as well because often people are in a bit of a crisis when they do approach you finally. So you have to be treating the humans as gently as the, as the animals. And, and I think some people will find that, in my experience, anyway, they found that a little bit of a challenging concept to to wrap their heads around. Yeah, it's sort of like it's uh, counterintuitive, I suppose, isn't it? It's sort of like uh, I've had uh, clients come to me for puppy classes, for instance, and the first thing they, particularly with puppies, is how do I stop my animal from nipping or biting at the children or whatever else and we spend very little time on stopping all of that stuff because I don't know how to train stopping stuff I actually know how to train an animal to um, offer calm behaviors and to have some level of self-control and we shape that and so it doesn't seem like we're dealing with the problem but in fact over time People, the lights go on and people start to understand that this other stuff we're teaching becomes more reinforcing for the puppy and the problematic behaviour is no longer practised because we make the new stuff at least as reinforcing as the bad stuff um, and generally more reinforcing. So the density of reinforcement is extremely high with the desirable behaviours, but I've got to work out with the client what they are. I can tell them what I like, but it's not necessarily what they want to live with. So that's the the part with pet owners particularly where I have to work out what it is that they would like to live with long term. Yeah, and what's your advice, I mean, to people listening out there that might have uh, a problem and undesirable behaviour, as I like to call them, with their animal and, and they're probably wanting their animal to stop doing this, that and the other. And I, I know conversations I've had with people in the past where I said, okay, cool, what do you want your animal to do instead? And they say, well, yes. I don't want them to do this. And I was like, okay, you don't want them to do that, but what do you want them to do instead? Well, I want them to yep. stop doing that. <laughs> and it's actually, so there's, uh, haven't you been listening to me? <laughs> yeah, don't you just, understand what I'm saying to you? <laughs> well, I think for some people, I think they've possibly never thought about it. You know, they've never gone, yep. okay, cool, he's going to stop that. But if he stops that, he's, 
he's, what is he going to be just sitting there, completely yeah. motionless, not doing anything? He's got to be doing something else. So what yeah. what is that something else in your in the perfect world? What would it be? You know, is that achievable? How can we set up a, a shaping plan, or change the environment, or do this or that? Uh, train those incompatible behaviours. Uh, you know, and and just that mindset can yeah. be enough to really get something going. And and like you say, just to put some actions in place. But what do you recommend to someone sitting at home right now? Who's this in there and who has just been wanting their animal to stop doing something for a long period of time? I mean, for me, it would just be to start asking yourself that question, what do I want my animal to do instead? But that, yeah, that's, quite, that, that's quite a challenging concept, I think, for some people. What we've got to do is look at what the problem behaviour is. I mean, I mean if we're going to analyse it properly and we're going to go back to behavioural science, we're going to look at the behaviour and define it. The, the, the behaviour is not the animal, by the way. The behaviour is just that. It's the action that the animal's doing. The animal is not vindictive, evil, um, trying to get at you, generally speaking, um, hasn't got any underlying motivation. It is performing behaviours for which it is being reinforced in some way. So we've got a – I guess the other thing that I ask often in that initial phase of a consultation is the person will describe – the problematic behaviour, and then I often ask them, now what do you do when that happens? That's important. Or what have you been doing before that happens as well? So that's important as well. So, for instance, with children and um, nipping puppies, often the, the parent will tell me that the children have been running around and screaming and the little puppy has been out in the backyard with them and you can understand with the hyper excitement of small squeaky children and a little squeaky puppy and the little squeaky puppy starts running after the kids and using its sharp little baby teeth on their little sensitive skin. The kids will scream a little bit more and the puppy thinks that's exciting and then more blah, blah, blah. So you can see how that the environment in that situation has reinforced the, the activity that people generally don't want. And um, so once people understand that they have some level of control over how to create an environment where that sort of behaviour doesn't happen. I, I th and I think it, it, it comes down to understanding once again, you know, that question there, what do you want the animal to do instead? And that's it's this generation of a new way of thinking for a lot of people. And, and understanding, you know, I like the saying that there's no such thing as a problem behaviour because when, when you've got They're behavior, just behaviours. Yes. Yeah, and it never happens in a vacuum. There's always like you just correctly identified stuff happening immediately before the behaviour and, and immediately after the behaviour. So the behaviour is kind of sandwiched in the middle there. And and the animal is kind of learning from the things that have reinforced it in the past, like you said, and then the environment's telling him, hey, you know, if I do this now, then this is going to be the likely outcome. And so those two pieces of the puzzle, those two elements of the stuff in the environment that's occurring before the behaviour and the stuff in the environment that's occurring after the behaviour, 99.9% of the time they're completely under our control. Or a lot that's of it. right. So if we can control those elements in some way, we can control that behaviour that we don't like. Exactly. And, and so quite often the problem behaviour could be just a little bit of self-reflecting on, on how we're interacting with that animal's environment and making sure that we're, we're setting the environment up to make, like you mentioned earlier, the right behaviours more reinforcing, if not at least the same to begin with level of reinforcement as, as the undesirable behaviours and, and then pairing the right reinforcers with correct behaviour. Uh, and I think that's, that's an important addition which, for people to start to understand. That it's, it's not really problem behaviour a lot of the time. It's, it's quite often a problem environment. Yeah, or, yeah, and environment inclusive of other individuals within the environment uh, or, or sometimes, though, we have behaviours that are self-reinforcing additionally. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, I deal a lot with uh, bull terriers that as a consequence to um, levels of anxiety and a predisposition within the breed, they'll spin. They actually tail chase. And that behaviour uh -huh. can get to a point where it is all the animal does in response to anything. Um, so what I, I need, if I see that in the early evolution of the behaviour, I have to work quickly to establish a range of behaviours that are actually not just as reinforcing but far more reinforcing for that animal to do. And they mean that's, that's a, because that 
problem can get to a point where it's actually quite pathological and yeah. n- not not changeable after a time. So um, it's it's actually um, life or death sometimes for those animals that that the way we respond quickly to stuff that's expressed that way um, will will have long term impacts on that animal's welfare. Um, often behaviours that we have that are problematic are not that serious and we've got a bit more flexibility in timing about how to address those things but over time I guess with the practicing of um, using uh, applying positive reinforcement and trying to manage behaviors in various state on various stages um, you get more efficient at it the more practice you get in trying to manipulate things in a positive manner, the better you get at it. Um, There's a simple recipe, I guess, when um, clients say, well, what should I train or teach instead? There are three little pointers that I get people to remember and I say, well, pick a behaviour that serves the same function for the animal. So, for instance, um, a lot of times when an animal is jumping up on you, like a young puppy is jumping up on you, what is it that is the puppy is after? The puppy is highly social and actually just wants social interaction in some way. The natural behaviour of a young puppy is to get up to the face of its mother and so by jumping up it is trying to kind of, it's probably trying to do that sort of behaviour and often people are shouting at it, pushing it down, um, saying no. But what you've got to think about is if the problem behaviour persists and you're doing all these things that are in some sense apparently negative, why didn't? Why then? Okay, here's the question for you, Ryan. Why then does the behaviour persist? I mean, the owner says, well, I've said no, I've pushed him down, I've run away, but it still does it. So what do I do? Yeah, I guess it's – and, and this is something I wanted to talk about as well. I guess you've got to look at, you know, and ask those questions that you highlighted before. What What are you doing after the behaviour occurs? And you know, a lot of people that might be listening to this, they might not be – very experienced trainers and whatnot have done too much training, but they're always hearing that word reinforcement thrown around. Uh, and, you know, it might not always be used in, in its correct fashion. So just to kind of define that for everyone out there listening, uh, reinforcement basically just means something that increases the frequency of behaviour in the future. And it's something that happens after behaviour. So I guess if you've got a dog jumping up on you and it's – and you're pushing it down and you're running away and you're doing this and you're doing that and, and the behaviours of it increasing or, or it's just being maintained and you've got to make that assumption or you, it's not even an assumption. You can say that whatever you're doing is is reinforcing that behaviour. It's, if it's That's being right. maintained, if it's, if it's increasing in frequency. So even though it, it might be challenging inside your mind to go, but hang on, when I look at this, I'm pushing it down. I'm, I'm telling it that I don't want it to do it. I'm running away. I'm trying to leave. But you've got to ask what, what's in it for that animal. And if that animal wants those types of interactions, if, if for it, it might, you know, just to chuck a label in here, uh, it might see it as playing, uh, and it yep. might be, then it's going to do it again. Because if it wants to play and it goes pushing away and, and chasing is playing, and you're saying pushing away and chasing is not playing, pushing away and chasing is me trying to stop a behaviour, then it's just aligning those two thought patterns in your mind and, and understanding the science. Um, and and I, was, I was saying earlier that I was thinking that I wanted to talk about this because, you know, also when, you, when you're asking your animal, when you, when you ask us that you want an animal to stop doing something, when you say, I want my animal to stop doing this, you know, that, that's the opposite of reinforcing. If, if we're stopping something, we're decreasing the, the frequency of that behaviour. And that's so, called punishment. And that's called punishment. And... Punishment, like reinforcement, can be anything. I don't want people listening out there to go, oh, punishment, he means hitting the dog, he means um, kicking the dog or yelling at the dog or this, that and the other. No, punishment just means that it's something that decreases the behaviour. If that dog didn't like being pushed away or it didn't like chasing you, it probably stop jumping off on your lap and you could say those things are punishment, punishing. Um, but for the dog that you described, you know, that that's what's happening there. So I guess people need to put that information into the equation when looking at the animal's behaviour and, and and say if an animal is maintaining a behaviour, then these things I'm doing that I think are going to decrease behaviour actually might be the things that are maintaining the behaviour. Exactly. So I often say uh, also when I'm speaking to a, a new client, I'll say 
um, and when we're just t- trying to nut out what's worrying them and what what's happening in their environment, etc. Also, the other question that I ask is, um, what have you tried so far? Because I don't really want to repeat, go down the route of what they've already done so far. And most of the time I hear that they've um, yelled at the puppy or they've pushed it down or they've given it time out in some way, time out meaning removing the puppy from the environment or removing themselves from the environment so the puppy can't interact with them. Um, and But I also then ask, so, but you've done all of that but the behaviour is persisting. So maybe now we try a different way. And so that's what they want to (laughs) hear because I do have solutions up my sleeve. Um, And so that's when the door is then open in their mind and then we can start working towards, um, in my mind, shaping a more positive resolution for both sides of the transaction, not just for the puppy. The puppy generally wants puppies, little puppy dogs, are highly social parrots are highly social and so a lot of what they're doing um, when in our presence is actually trying to get our attention so what we've got to think about is trying to teach the puppy a range of behaviors and not just one or two but a broad range of behaviors for which the owner will consistently provide attention and some level of reinforcement Um, I often use food as a primary reinforcer to motivate the creation of these behaviors but uh, but additional to that is that the puppy is desirable desiring attention from that human being. So we've got to pick a behaviour that serves the same function for the animal but is also acceptable for the people involved. Um, and the alternate must be must give that animal at least the same quality of reinforcement that it's getting from the problematic behaviour. And the new behaviour must be the one must be one that the animal can or be trained to perform really easily. Um, so that the problem behaviour just doesn't happen anymore. Basically, animals generally choose to do things that are easier for them to do. So if you make it, one, harder for them to perform the problem behaviour and make it very easy for them to perform desirable behaviours, the puppy will, or the animal will choose always to go down the easy route. All of us do. It's normal natural behavior so I'm kind of using the things I know through science and making them hopefully making them accessible to the the understanding of everyone I deal with um, at the same level and the outcomes being positive for both sides and um, the other thing that's important is that if the owners have to realize and trainers have to realize that every second they're with their animals they're actually training them so that every moment no moment should be wasted everything every interaction must be considered to be an opportunity for training and learning have you found that too Ryan yeah I think definitely and, and I think definitely working you know coming from a zoo background myself and, and working with animals, and, and if anyone out there's ever been uh, a zookeeper in their life, and that that's a very busy day. You're walking around, and you know if you're not a zookeeper, we don't just hug animals and play with animals all day. Uh, we're generally looking after really? their, their <laughs> welfare and, and making sure they've got hygienic spaces to live in, and they've got a nice healthy diet, and that's where a lot of our time goes. But we're we're in their spaces, we're in their environments, we're cleaning, we're remodeling we're doing whatever and the animals a lot of the time are just watching us you know they're watching us and they're watching what's going on and and i think that's forgotten a lot uh with with keepers sometimes and i I, i've been uh guilty of that myself and and forgetting that uh and and you can very easily you know build that trust that we talked about before by yeah seizing those moments uh and and making sure paying what you want paying what you want if you see something you like pay attention to it and let them know and have reinforcers ready to go and yep and, and being prepared uh, so the the important thing i guess we wanted to to take away from today and my brain is pinging my brain is going left right and center on, on all side <laughs> topics that can deviate from this main idea uh but i guess me and kat wanted to talk about today you know when you, when you're asking your animal to stop doing something um i guess think about what you're actually asking there you're asking for and remember i'm not using punishment in a in a way that people are hitting and yelling and being doing abusive things to their animals i'm just saying uh scientifically speaking you're talking about a punishment solution where we're we're trying to head towards positive reinforcement here to in, improve the trust 
and, and the relationships we have with our animals and to to increase that welfare overall. So the, the big idea here is to to change your mindset uh, and and ask yourself, start asking yourself questions like what what do you want your animal to do and to start to focus on on your own behaviour as well. And like you just very beautifully articulated setting that environment up for success with your animals and making those right behaviours easy and, and making sure that you're prepared with reinforcers. You know what your reinforcers are and you're prepared all the time and, and pairing them with the desirable behaviours. Do you want to add and anything I, on? I, yeah, and I guess leading back to some of the show work both you and I have been doing um, recently, what I want to create in animal, every animal that is involved in any um, public display is that I want those animals to understand that when they're actually on that stage, that is their moment in their day when all the fabulous things happen for them in their lives. They have an opportunity to play that with their environment, with the whole world, with their trainers, and they have an opportunity to gain lots of reinforcement in, in that stage. I want to see an animal that's going on stage really wanting to be there. I want them to, if they're on a leash, I want them to be straining against the leash when they're being released from their crate. I want them to burst out there within moments of that opportunity to go because when they're out there, they know it's fun they know it's really worthwhile for them they know it's highly reinforcing and it's interesting i want them to know it's challenging and fun and enjoyable so that what they present as an individual and representative of their species is very real and very honest and is an opportunity for teaching about its um their counterparts in the wild about the, the reality of their counterparts in the wild so they're giving us an opportunity to speak of that um, and they they themselves can speak of that themselves and, but I want it to be a really positive experience both for the people who are watching but particularly for the animal involved that's 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 what's most important to me when I'm creating a show beautiful and for those of you who haven't uh, check out www creativeanimalsolutions.com uh, to go to Dr. Cat's website and you've been training quolls and dingoes and owls. Barking so, owls, yeah, barking so far. Owls and you've got a little baby barn owl. Little, Yeah, I've got a little beton coming on and a little Major Mitchell about to hit the stage as well. We're not quite ready yet. We're just growing into it right now. But, um, yeah, it's going to be fun. Come on down and see us at Peace Tower. The, the little baby dingo targeting video you made is adorable yeah they're only uh, about babies are only about six and a half weeks old there i think and it's just their beginning their very first moment in their training life and their very first moment that's me doing the training um but the the progression from that basic stuff that you see in that little tiny video and the other thing that i that i always um find to highlight is that how short the session is there's a lot of learning that goes on within a minute um so you don't have to train an animal for an hour to get a lot of stuff happening oh i want those little babies to learn that when i'm around the opportunity for fun is there and it's um it's lovely to see and it's just lovely to see it um even now now as they're more progressed and so we've faded out all those bits and pieces and now they're kind of just performing as if they know how to act like little actors. But um, that's that's come from from that basic basic journey where we started to join the dots in their brain. So, yeah, if you are in the Melbourne area, then do head down. I don't know where Moonlit Century is. I've never been there, Cat. Maybe just highlight exactly where you're located. Um, it's just off the... Tyab Turden Road, and it's you just do a search for Moonlit Sanctuary, and it's based in Piersdale. You will find it. It's about forty minutes from where I live in Blairgarry, and if you're coming from the city, it's about probably about forty minutes from the city of Melbourne as well. So um, it's quite a small sanctuary. It's very big on interaction, and um, you'll see lots of happy humans and lots of happy people there right now. And everyone's a little bit nervous, so if you do come in the show, just sit quietly. But we'll after every show, the trainers will be around for talking, so you can actually. Find find out how they've created some of the behaviours that you'll see and um, ask them personal questions about the individual animals that you'll see as well. So um, please come on down and if you do, make yourself known to us and um, you'll say hi. Yeah, say that you listen to the podcast. and uh, Yeah, anyone, that'd be great. All over Australia, uh, head down to, to Melbourne and Moonlit Centre. Oh, my goodness. Anywhere, uh, <laughs> I don't know whether we've got the capacity. But... Australia's on their bucket list, so we hope, <laughs> <laughs> hope you get to go swimming in the uh, waters in, in Australia. 
with the sharks and crocodiles. <laughs> Thank well, you. Uh, <laughs> th- thanks, thanks for listening, everyone. Um, it's been a pleasure, as always, Dr. Cat. And I know that we thanks, can probably, Ryan. probably sit here for the next couple of hours talking behaviour. But we'll leave it at that for today. Um, for, for those listening, we, we want to hear from you. Uh, Absolutely. We, Um, yeah, if you go onto Facebook, everybody, and do a search for Creative Animal Solutions, it's a closed group, but it's a, basically a broad exposure. I've created it as a broad exposure to animal welfare training and environmental and education, um, and it's across a, the broadest range of species that I can have. And I, I also put up a lot of applied behavioral science stuff there as well. So it's not a specific journey but overall you'll see that it's um about welfare underlying everything but with um, a bias towards teaching people about how to interact with animals in a better way for the for now and in the future so all you have to do is subscribe ask me to sub you and um you can join the some 800 other people up there on that um site as well we've got a lot of um very big names who are on that on that list as well including ryan and um everyone's there to help each other so it's a very um uh, lovely group interaction wise and it's a great opportunity for education in a free context as well so um please take advantage of it please do and two things about facebook's creative animal solution page i haven't found another space where i've enjoyed uh, the the group mind think and the inspiring conversations uh challenging conversations opportunities to learn that have occurred within that space you've created uh cat so thank you for that and also and i was saying this to cat the other day if ever on board and I'm, I'm sat down doesn't happen much but if i'm on a train or on a bus and i i get my phone out and i'll just go to creative animal solutions and see what you've posted because you're posting <laughs> stuff every day and yeah. I, I really love it and just that's quite, good i'm glad you do stuff. So go i'm not posting out. in a vacuum i'm not posting in a vacuum i know that and so um it's not and once you're a member of that group you're allowed to post as well so never be shy about introducing yourself a lot of people are a little shy and i do try and draw them out to say hello but um you can sit there and lurk and enjoy it just as much and hopefully get some value in the educational opportunity too so hopefully see you there too yeah, so definitely head over, check that out. Uh, we're, we're talking about, you know, it's all up in the air. What do you guys want? Tell us. We're talking about doing a joint animal training academy, creative animal solution podcast once a month. Uh, as we highlighted and as we alluded to at the start of this podcast, there are some great minds out there uh, and we want you to learn from them. Um, so we're going to endeavor really hard to get them on here for you. Uh, you can find this podcast series on iTunes. Um, so head over there and check it out. Subscribe so you'll know when the next episode is out. Uh, jump over to animaltrainingacademy.com. Join up. Do the course. It's free. Uh, check out the podcast. Uh, comment. Ask us your questions. Head over to Creative Animal Solutions uh, on Facebook. Web page. Visit Dr. Cat. Uh, and you'll be hearing from us again soon. Yep. Thanks, Ryan. It's been great fun. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. See you again soon. Bye.